about the poet Maya Angelou 1928 to 2014 is an acclaimed American poet storyteller whose Asian trekking handled the 17-year-old's climbing permit and other logistics. I am delighted as he now becomes the youngest climber in the world to scale Lehots. The Ryan International School student is set on a career of adventure. He wants to follow the footsteps of legendary climber Renhold Messner by submitting all 14 over 8000 meter peaks in the world aiming to be the youngest to achieve the feat Arjun's next stop is the South Pole where he aims to go this winter while his peers at school will be busy with college admission and making smart career choices Arjun will seek sponsors for this mission I have climbed Mount Everest and now would like to go to the north and south pole. I would also like to climb the 12 remaining highest peaks in the world. He told the Times of India in an interview.
is acknowledged in India as the father of the nation. Gandhi ji was also an efficient writer. He wrote many books including an autobiography. The story of my experiments with truth. Read the given extract from the autobiography. I must have been about 7 when my father left Porbandar for Rajkot. There I was put into a primary school and I can well recollect those days including the names and other particulars of the teachers who taught me as at porbandar so here there is hardly anything to note about my studies i could only have been a mediocre student from this school i went to the suburban school and thence to the high school having already reached my 12th year I do not remember having ever told a lie during this short period either to my teachers or to my schoolmates I used to be very shy and avoided all company my books and my lessons were my sole companions to be at school at the stroke of the hour and to run back home as soon as the school closed that was my daily habit I literally ran back because i could not bear to talk to anybody i was even afraid lest any one should poke fun at me there is an incident which occurred at the examination during my first year at the high school and which is worth recording mr gills the educational inspector had come on a visit of inspection He had set us five words to write as a spelling exercise. One of the words was kettle. I had misspelled it. The teacher tried to prompt me with the point of his boot, but I would not be prompted. It was beyond me to see that he wanted me to copy the spelling from my neighbor's slate. for i had thought that the teacher was there to supervise us against copying the result was that all the boys except myself were found to have spelled every word correctly only i had been stupid the teacher tried later to bring this stupidity home to me but without effect i never could learn the art of copying My studies were continued. I was not regarded as a dunce at the high school. I always enjoyed the affection of my teachers. Certificates of progress and character used to be sent to the parents every year. I never had a bad certificate. In fact, I even won prizes after I passed out of the second standard. In the 5th and 6th I obtained scholarships of rupees 4 and 10 respectively. My own recollection is that I had not any high regard for my ability. I used to be astonished whenever I won prizes and scholarships, but I very jealously guarded my character. The least little blemish drew tears from my eyes. When I merited or seemed to the teacher to merit a rebuke it was unbearable for me i remember having once received corporal punishment i did not so much mind the punishment as the fact that it was considered my desert i wept piteously that was when i was in the first or second standard there was another such incident during the time when i was in the seventh standard Dorabji Dulzi Gimi was the headmaster then. He was popular among boys as he was a disciplinarian, a man of method and a good teacher. He had made gymnastics and cricket compulsory for boys of the upper standards. I disliked both. I never took part in any exercise, cricket or football. Therefore, they were made compulsory. My shyness was one of the reasons for this aloofness which i now see was wrong 
I then had the false notion that gymnastics had nothing to do with education. Today, I know that physical training should have as much place in the curriculum as mental training. I may mention, however, that I was none the worse for abstaining from exercise. That was because I had read in books about the benefits of long walks in the open air and having liked the advice, I had formed a habit of taking walks which was still remained with me. These walks gave me a fairly hardy constitution. The reason of my dislike for gymnastics was my keen desire to serve as nurse to my father. As soon as the school closed, I would hurry home and begin serving him. Compulsory exercise came directly in the way of this service. I requested Mr. Gimme to exempt me from gymnastics so that I might be free to serve my father. But he would not listen to me. Now, it so happened that one Saturday when we had school in the morning, I had to go from home to the school for gymnastics at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I had no watch and the clouds deceived me. Before I reached the school, the boys had all left. The next day, Mr. Gimme, examining the role, found me marked absent. Being asked the reason for absence, I told him what had happened. He refused to believe me and ordered me to pay a fine of one or two annas. I was convicted of lying. That deeply pained me. How was I to prove my innocence? There was no way. I cried in deep anguish. I saw that a man of truth must also be a man of care. This was the first and last instance of my carelessness in school. I have a faint recollection that I finally succeeded in getting the fine remitted. The exemption from exercise was of course obtained as my father wrote himself to the headmaster saying that he wanted me at home after school. But though I was none the worse for having neglected exercise, I am still paying the penalty of another neglect. I do not know whence I got the notion that good handwriting was not a necessary part of education. I was ashamed of myself and repented of my neglect. I saw that bad handwriting should be regarded as a sign of an imperfect education. I tried later to improve mine, but it was too late. I could never repair the neglect of my youth. Let every young man and woman be warned by my example and understand that good handwriting is a necessary part of education. I am now of opinion that children should first be taught the art of drawing before learning how to write. Let the children learn his letters by observation as he does different objects such as flowers, birds, etc. And let him learn handwriting only after he has learnt to draw objects. He will then write a beautifully formed hand. M. K. Gandhi Chapter 4 Stranger by the Window Theme Moral Values Kickstart A lesson that not all strangers are bad and we should check ourselves first before pointing a finger at someone else. How is that? thought Neha. That was a book, her new book. She had not even finished reading it. How was it with the man at the window? The window berth was just opposite their cubicle which Neha and her mother were sharing with the lady on the bunk. It was one of the old second class sleeper compartments. Neha liked it. She liked the corridor that separated the cubicles from the window berth. One could have a stroll along it. Neha had been enjoying chit-chatting with her friend Nikhil in the other cubicle. While coming back, 
Just at the entrance of the cubicle, she looked back and spotted the book. How come my book is lying with you, sir, here? Neha cried out. The man did not stir. He was busy reading a newspaper that covered his face sideways. He did not reply. That enraged Neha. Excuse me, she asked earnestly. Yes, the man replied without looking up. Busy reading, uh? Listen, can I take my book? Neha was angry. Your book? Which one? The man looked around. My book, yes, this one, Panchatantra. Neha pointed out to the book lying among a host of other books and magazines kept by his side. Are you sure this is your book? The man asked. His face lit up with a faint smile. He kept on looking at her. This could be mine too. He quipped without waiting for an answer. Is he kidding? A book for children? His? Coming on to mischief? She thought to herself. Ma, look, the book Kumar uncle gave me at the station. He has taken it. Neha called her mother. Mother did not hear instantly. The train was moving fast and there was the noise. Neha could not control herself. She ran to Ma picking up the book in haste. Mom, did not Kumar uncle gave me this book? Neha asked holding the book up. Yes, of course. What is it? Mother was curious. He has taken away my book. Now he wonders it belongs to me at all. Neha's voice full of emotion. But where did you keep it? Ma wanted to catch the situation. There in my bag over there, Neha pointed to the corner of her berth. Ma was not sure if the man at the window had been to their side in the cubicle at any time during Neha's absence. She did not remember to have noticed any such move on his part. On the other hand, he had been there all along, completely occupied with reading, could be an ardent book lover like Neha, mother thought. But the book was a gift to Neha from Kumar which was a fact. There was no doubt about it. You should know how to look after your things while on a journey. Now sit down and read if you like. Neha's mother did not like any kind of commotion. The lady on the bunk was not satisfied. You meet all sorts of people in trains. She commented, putting an extra force on all sorts. The man at the window did not seem to mind it. He was friendly. He said, if you think the book is yours, you... He was interrupted with vehemence. This is mine, of course. This is my Panchatantra book for children. Neha held the book up showing the cover, as if to prove that children's books should remain only with the children. But the man fumbled as he watched Neha fumbling. Well, you can keep it, baby. He quietly stood up, walked out of the compartment, leaving all his books, magazines, all belongings unguarded on his berth. You can keep it. You can keep it, baby. What does he mean? Neha is no longer a baby. Neha is full 11 years old. She is not a careless little girl. Neha sat down on her berth, opened the book but was unable to concentrate. Her little mind was disturbed. The train, meanwhile, built up speed. Some passengers began moving and arranging their luggage. The destination was close. Neha caressed the book on her lap. She could not afford to lose it. The lady on the bunk watched her and threw a consolation commenting, you cannot do a thing. These days, all such people move about freely in gentleman's attire. No manners. The man returned, caught up half the comment. He waited for a minute, bundled up his things and left the compartment, perhaps to wait at the exit door. 
what was the hurry he could not jump out of a raining train most disagreeable men neha pondered the train was pulling in at the station daddy would be in any moment neha should be ready to get off she picked up a bag and started putting her little things in mom look please what is it mother asked she stood up what is it dear she repeated look my book is here my copy of panchtantra is here in my bag the copy in her hand was not actually hers did you not check it before girl what an awful thing to do this copy may be for his own children at home the lady on the bunk was ready to get down she eyed neha with disdain the man should have talked to her should have told her clearly he should have been frank with the child mother intervened what a man neha added in support of a mother's argument neha was dazed holding two copies of panchtantra in two hands she tried to hold back her tears she was sorry that she could not say sorry to the man at the window chapter 5 oh captain my captain theme sorrow kickstart this poem is written on the death of the american president abraham lincoln and thus is highly metaphorical oh captain my captain our fearful trip is done the ship has weathered every rack the prize we sought is won the port is near the bells are here the people all exulting while follow eyes the steady keel the vessel grim and daring but to oh heart 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 oh the bleeding drops of red where on the deck my captain lies fallen cold and dead oh captain my captain rise up and hear the bells rise up for you the flag is flung for you the bugle trills for you bouquets and ribboned wreaths for you the shores are crowding for you they call the swaying mass their eager faces turning Hear captain dear father this arm beneath your head it is some dream that on the deck you have fallen cold and dead my captain does not answer his lips are pale and still my father does not feel my arm he has no pulse nor will the ship is anchored safe and sound its voyage closed and done from fearful trip the victor ship comes in with object one exult o shores and ring o bells but i with mournful tread walk the deck my captain lies fallen cold and dead walt whitman about the poet walt whitman 1819 to 1892 was an american writer He is particularly renowned for his poems. Chapter 6 The Unwanted Guest Theme Presence of Mind Kickstart This play is based on Saki's story The Miracle Merchant. However, keeping in mind the restrictions of a stage setting, certain liberties have been taken with the text. Two friends of his mother who do not see eye to eye are scheduled to be at their country house at the same time so clovis the son of mrs buwissel takes upon himself the task of tackling a tricky situation for his mother their old trusted butler plays a stellar role in the entire act albeit without being told of actual situation read through this humorous account of how intelligently clovis handles the whole situation characters mrs buwissel clovis her son sturridge the butler jane martlet mrs buwissel's guest 
dining room in Mrs. Beuvisel's country house. Mrs. Beuvisel is seated at the table. She is having her breakfast. Enter Clovis. Mrs. Beuvisel, I have just had a letter from Dora Bithalls Beth- to say she is coming on Thursday. Clovis, this next Thursday, isn't it rather awkward? Mrs. Beuvisel, why awkward? Clovis, Jane Martlett has only been here five days and she never stays less than a fortnight. You'll never get her out of the house by Thursday. Mrs. Beuvisel, why should I? She and Dora are good friends, aren't they? They used to be. Clovis, they used to be. That's what makes them such better enemies now. Mrs. Beuvisel, but what has happened? What have they quarreled about? Clovis, a hen. Mrs. Beuvisel, a hen? What hen? Clovis, it was a bronze like horn or some such breed. And Dora sold it to Jane at a rather higher price. Mrs. Beuvisel, if Jane agreed to the price, I don't see what there was to quarrel about. Clovis, well, you see, it turned out the bird would not lay eggs. And I am told that the letters which passed between the two women were extremely rude. Mrs. Beuvisel, how ridiculous. Couldn't some of their friends get them to end the quarrel? Clovis, people tried. Jane was willing to take back some of her most insulting remarks if Dora would take back and hen. If Dora would beg, if Dora would take back the hen. Mrs. Beuvisel, and did she? Clovis, no. She said that would be admitting she was in the wrong. And Dora would never do that. Mrs. Beuvisel, having both of them here would be a most awkward situation. Do you suppose they won't speak to each other? Do you suppose they won't speak to each other? Clovis, on the contrary, the difficulty will be to get them to stop speaking. Mrs. Beuvisel, what is to be done? I can't put Dora off. I have already postponed her visit once and nothing short of a miracle would make Jane leave before her fortnight is over. Clovis, I don't mind trying to supply a miracle at short notice. Mrs. Beuvisel, as long as you don't drag me into it. Exit Mrs. Beuvisel. Enter Jane. Sturridge enters with a white toast rack and places it on the table. Jane helps herself to a toast. Exit Sturridge. Clovis. Servants are a bit of a nuisance. Jane Martlett. Servants a nuisance? I should think they were. The trouble I have had in getting a good servant. But I don't see what they have to complain of. Your mother is so wonderfully lucky in her servants. Sturridge, for instance, he's been with you for years and I am sure he's a jewel as far as butlers go. Clovis Uh, That's just the trouble. It's when servants have been with you for years that they become a really serious nuisance. The here today and gone tomorrow sort doesn't matter. You have simply got to replace them. It's the stairs and the jewels that are the real worry. Jane Martlett But if they give satisfaction, Clovis, that doesn't prevent them from giving trouble. Now you have mentioned storage. It was storage I was particularly thinking of when I made the remark about servants being a nuisance. Jane Martlett the excellent storage and nuisance. I don't believe it. Clovis, 
I know he is excellent, but have you ever considered what it must be like to go on unceasingly doing the correct thing in the correct manner in the same surroundings for the greater part of a lifetime? Jane Martlet, I should go mad. Clovis, exactly mad. Jane Martlet, but Sturridge hasn't gone mad. Clovis, on most points, he is thoroughly sane and reliable, but at times he is subject to delusions. Jane Martlet, delusions? What sort of delusions? Clovis, unfortunately, they usually center around the guests. That is where the awkwardness comes in. Now and then, he gets some idea about a guest which might take an unfortunate turn. That is precisely what is worrying me at the present moment. Jane Martlet Why? Has he taken some fancy about me? Clovis Yes. Jane Martlet Who on earth does he think I am? Clovis Queen Anne Jane Martlet Queen Anne? What an idea! But anyhow, there is nothing dangerous about her. She is such a colorless personality. Clovis, what does history chiefly say about Queen Anne? Jane Martlet, uh, the only thing that I can remember about her is the saying, Queen Anne is dead. Clovis, exactly, dead. Jane Martlet, do you think he takes me for the ghost of Queen Anne? Clovis Ghost? No. No one ever heard of a ghost that came down to breakfast and ate toast and honey with a healthy appetite. No, it's the fact of you being so very much alive and flourishing that bewilders and annoys him. All his life he has thought of Queen Anne as standing for everything that is dead and done with. And now he has to fill your glass at lunch and dinner and listen to your stories. And naturally he feels that something is very wrong with you. Jane Martlet But he wouldn't harm me on that account, would he? Clovis I didn't get really alarmed about it till lunch today. I caught him looking at you with a very threatening look and muttering, ought to be dead long ago, she ought and someone should see to it. Jane Martlet This is awful. Your mother must be told about it at once. Clovis My mother must not hear a word about it. It would upset her dreadfully. She relies on storage for everything. Jane Martlet but he might kill me at any moment. Clovis, not at any moment. He is busy with his work all afternoon. Jane Martlet, what a dreadful situation to be in with a mad butler dangling over one's head. But I am certainly not going to cut my visit short. Exit. Clovis, dismayed. What a woman. <laughs> Enter Starage. He begins cleaning the table. Clovis looks at him reflectively. Clovis, where is Miss Martlet? Sturridge, in the morning room, sir, writing letters. Clovis, pointing to a sword on the wall. She wants to copy the inscription on the blade. I wish you would take it to her. Her hands are oily. Take it without the sheath. It will be less trouble. Sturridge. Yes, sir. Sturridge goes out, holding sword. Enters Jane, running. Jane Martlet. Clovis, Clovis, where are you? Rushes upstairs, enters Sturridge. Sturridge, perplexed. Miss Martlet ran out of the room as I entered. She has called for the car to take her to the station. Saki. About the author, Hector Hugh Munro, 1870 to 1916, better known by the pen name Saki, was a British author, best known for his witty short stories. 
Born in British Burma, he moved to England. As he embarked on his literary career, he picked up the name Saki from the Rubaiyat, a long poem by 12th century Persian writer Omar Khayyam. When World War I began, the writer rushed to enlist. During a night march through France in 1916, he was shot and killed by a German sniper. Chapter 7 A Man's Job Theme Courage Kickstart How maturity is not related to age but the actions of an individual. Let's read the chapter to know about this fact of life. While playing in the lawn, Nikhil saw Rohan coming out of the house with his bat, wickets and ball. He ran towards him and asked, "Rohan bhaiya, are you going to play cricket?" "Yes. Can I come with you?" asked Nikhil eagerly. "Oh no, your small and weak grown up boys play a very rough game. Please bhaiya, even if I can't play, at least I can do something. I can collect the ball for you people." Nikhil insisted. He was not ready to give up easily. No, we play with a cork ball and it is very hard. You may get hurt," said Rohan as he put his cricket gear on his bicycle and rode off at top speed. Nikhil watched him with admiration. Oh, how fast he can cycle! He thought. Rohan was his hero and he adored him. His sour point was that Rohan always treated him as a kid which he hated. He talked to himself, "I am no more a child. I am going to be 9 next month. I walk alone from the bus stop to the house. Mother sends me to mother dairy booth to fetch milk sometimes, and above all, I can climb a tree which even Rohan bhaiya cannot." Nikhil lived on the first floor while Rohan lived on the ground floor of the same bungalow. Nikhil lived with his parents and grandmother. Rohan who was 14 lived with his parents, grandparents and a grown-up brother. His father owned a big jewelry shop in the city. As both Nikhil's parents worked, he spent most of the day with his grandmother. There were not many children of Nikhil's age in the neighborhood. Rohan played with Nikhil sometimes. One day, Rohan said in confidence to Nikhil, "I won a tennis ball in the school fete yesterday. I have kept it for you. It is safe enough for you to play cricket with." "But bhaiya, I am no more a little child," blurted out Nikhil indignantly. "Okay, okay. Don't get so worked up." Rohan had come the outburst. I am free in the afternoon. Come, we will play Monopoly. You can have lunch with me. Oh, good! I will just go upstairs and change my clothes. Nikhil dashed up the stairs, threw the school bag off, and changed his clothes. He was putting on his T-shirt and shorts and shouted, "Dadi, I am going to Rohan Bhaiya's house to play Monopoly. I will have my lunch there." The whole exercise took a few minutes and he was at the front door of Rohan's house. He pressed the bell and waited, but no one opened the door. He again pressed the bell for a longer period. He pressed his ears against the door and heard footsteps behind the closed door. The door was still closed. Strange, thought Nikhil. Only 5 minutes earlier Rohan bhaiya invited me and now he is not opening the door. He ran to the back and found the door also bolted from inside. Then he ran towards the left side of Rohan's room. He went to the window which was closed. Its panes covered with black paper. Suddenly he heard a voice. "Who who is there?" It was Rohan's voice but he was speaking in whispers. It is me, Nikhil. You invited me, and now, shh! Interrupted Rohan quickly. Nikhil, you will have to help us. Robbers are here inside. Robbers? 
have they got pistols yes they have they were here when i came as soon as i entered they overpowered me and locked me in this room with my grandmother are you scared oh no not at all said nikhil then inform the police can you manage oh certainly keeping to the hedge nikhil quietly walked out of the gate then ran with all his might he was breathless when he reached the police he was breathless when he reached the police assistance booth he found the policeman and started speaking at once sir please come with me my house is being robbed i mean my friends i mean rohan bhaiya's house what are you blabbering child don't waste our time we are too busy for your pranks instead of roaming around in the seat go back to your house said one of the policemen and started writing in his register another policeman was talking on the telephone every minute is precious thought nikhil desperately he looked around and noticed a watch lying at the counter he grabbed the watch and started running the policemen were the policemen were bewildered for a minute two policemen ran after nikhil shouting hey you thief give back the watch or we will lock you in the jail the road was empty therefore no one else joined the chase by the time nikhil reached the gate of the house the policemen caught him please sirs don't get angry i never intended to steal your watch i only played this trick to bring you here said nikhil now the policeman looked less hostile one took out the notebook and pen from his pocket and wrote something then he tore the page from the notebook and gave it to nikhil and said son run back to the booth again as fast as you can and give this to the policeman there tell me which the house is go straight to the left side of the house and knock on the window there rohan bhaiya is there nikhil spoke and ran back to the police booth at top speed within minutes he was there again the policeman shouted as he saw nikhil you naughty boy where is the watch oh believe me i am not a thief read this quickly your friend has sent nikhil handed the note to the policeman and waited impatiently as soon as the policeman read the note he swung into action he gave some message on the walkie talkie soon a flying squad arrived nikhil and the other policeman also climbed into the jeep when they reached rohan's house the policeman who were there already joined them and informed robbers are still inside two of them are armed with pistols in all there are four the police quietly surrounded the house after a while the front door opened and a man holding a pistol came out cautiously he looked around and finding no one he signaled to his friends to come out three more persons came out one was holding a canvas bag the other a pistol and the third was empty handed as they started moving towards the gate the inspector shouted catch and the police party attacked thoroughly unprepared for this sudden attack the robbers lost their wits they were soon overpowered and disarmed the police arrested them and herded them into a jeep the policemen accompanying the robbers left in the jeep and and the rest of the men went inside they untied rohan and his grandmother then they went into the other bedroom where they untied rohan's mother and grandfather his grandfather was badly injured in the scuffle with the robbers the ambulance was called through wireless since the robbers had cut the telephone line at rohan's house Meanwhile they all assembled in the drawing room Nikhil narrated the whole story gaps were filled by Rohan and his mother the police inspector patted Nikhil and said you all must thank the small boy for your rescue it was his presence of mind which saved you Rohan came to Nikhil and said 
Hey, I always treated you as a small kid, but you are a very brave boy. You really did a man's job. For Nikhil, this was the happiest moment. He was no more a small child for Rohan Bhaiya. His face beamed with joy. Rohan Bhaiya, can I come to play cricket with you now? He asked shyly. Rohan nodded with a smile. Chapter 8 Bruno Goes Exploring Theme Historical Fiction Kickstart This passage, an extract from the book, The Boy in the Stripped Pajamas, is set during World War II in Nazi Germany. It is about a nine-year-old boy, Bruno, whose life changes completely when his family moves from the city of Berlin to the countryside. He is too young to realize that his father is a high-ranking Nazi official who works in the dreaded Auschwitz concentration camp for Jews. The book is about Bruno's friendship with a Jewish boy of his own age who lives in the camp. In this extract, Bruno starts to settle down in his new home, but lonely and bored, he decides to explore his surroundings, including the camp where he has been forbidden to go. Nothing changed for quite a while at Outwith. Bruno still had to put up with his sister Gretel, being less than friendly to him whenever she was in a bad mood, and he still wished that he could go back home to Berlin, although the memories of that place were beginning to fade. The soldiers still came and went every day of the week, holding meetings in father's office, which was still out of bonds at all times and no exceptions. The servants still came and washed things and swept things and cooked things and cleaned things and served things and took things away and kept their mouths shut unless they were spoken to. But then things changed. Father decided it was time for the children to return to their studies and although it seemed ridiculous to Bruno that school should take place when there were only two students to teach. But mother and father agreed that a tutor should come to the house every day and fill their mornings and afternoons with lessons. A few mornings later, a man called Her Lists rattled up the driveway on his bone shaker and it was time for school again. Her Lists was a mystery to Bruno. Although he was friendly enough most of the time, never raising his hand to him like his old teacher in Berlin had done, some, something in his eyes made Bruno feel there was anger inside him just waiting to get out. Her list was particularly fond of history and geography, while Bruno preferred reading and art. Those things are useless to you, insisted the teacher. A sound understanding of the social sciences is far more important in this day and age. But aren't books important? asked Bruno. Books about things that matter in the world, of course, explained her list. But not story books, not books about things that never happened. How much do you know of your history anyway, young man? Well, I know I was born on April the 15th, 1934, said Bruno. Not your own personal history, interrupted her list. I mean the history of who you are, where you come from, your family's heritage, the fatherland. Bruno frowned. He wasn't entirely sure that father had any land because although the house in Berlin was large and comfortable, there wasn't very much garden space around it. And he was old enough to know that Outwith did not belong to them despite all the land there. Not very much, he admitted finally. Although I know quite a bit about the Middle Ages. I like stories about knights and adventure and exploring. 
her list shook his head angrily then this is what i am here to change he said in a sinister voice to get your head out of your story books and teach you more about where you come from about the great wrongs that have had been done to you bruno nodded and felt quite pleased as he assumed that he would finally be given an explanation for why they had all been forced to leave their comfortable home and come to this terrible place which must have been the greatest strong ever committed to him in his short life sitting alone in his room a few days later bruno started thinking about all the things he liked to do at home that he hadn't been able to do since he had come out to out with most of them came about because he no longer had any friends to play with but there was one thing that he was able to do on his own he had done it all the time back in berlin and that was exploring when i was a child bruno said to himself i used to enjoy exploring i have never really done any exploring here perhaps it's time to start bruno jumped off his bed and rummaged in his wardrobe for an overcoat and an old pair of boots the kinds of clothes he thought a real explorer might wear and prepared to leave the house for months now bruno had been looking out of his bedroom window at the garden and the bench with the plaque on it the tall fence and the wooden telegraph poles and all the other things he had written to grandmother about in his most recent letter and as often as he had watched the people all the different kinds of people in their stripped pajamas it had never really occurred to him to wonder what it was all about it was as if it were another city entirely the people all living and working together side by side with the house where he lived and were they really so different all the people in the camp wore the same clothes those pajamas and their stripped cloth caps too and all the people who wandered through his house wore uniforms with bright red and black armbands and carried guns and always looked terribly stern as if it were all very important really and no one should think otherwise what exactly was the difference he wondered to himself and who decided which people wore the stripped pajamas and which people wore the uniforms of course sometimes the two groups mixed he had often seen the people from his side of the fence on the other side and it was clear that they were in charge the pajama people all jumped to attention whenever the soldiers approached and sometimes they fell to the ground and sometimes they didn't even get up and had to be carried away instead it's funny that i have never wondered about those people bruno thought and it's funny that when you think of all the times the soldiers go over there and he had even seen father go over there on many occasions that none of the stripped pajama people had ever been invited back to the house leaving the house bruno went round the back and looked up towards his own bedroom window he looked as far as to his right as he could see and the tall fence seemed to carry on in the sunlight and he was glad that it did because it meant that he didn't know what was up ahead and he could walk and find out and that was what exploration was all about after all before heading off in that direction though there was one final thing to investigate and that was the bench all these months he had been looking at it and staring at the plaque from a distance and calling it the bench with the plaque but he still had no idea what it said looking left and right to make sure that no one was coming he ran over to it and squinted as he read the words it was only a small bronze plaque and bruno read it quietly to himself presented on the occasion of the opening of he hesitated 
out with camp he continued stumbling over the name as usual june 1940 he reached out and touched it for a moment and the bronze was very cold so he pulled his fingers away the foot taking a deep breath and beginning his journey the one thing bruno tried not to think about was that he had been told on countless occasions by both mother and father that he was not allowed to walk in this direction that he was not allowed anywhere near the fence or the camp and most particularly that exploration was banned at outwit with no exceptions john boyne chapter 9 peter of harlem theme legend kickstart have you ever thought about doing something brave and becoming famous this is a dutch legend about a boy who saved his town from being flooded by the sea read on to find what he did on that bright spring day a little boy whose name is said to have been peter and whose father was a slicer had for his dinner some cakes his mother had baked them because she knew how much peter liked them Peter was a very unselfish boy and whenever he had anything he liked his first thought always was to share it with someone else so so as soon as he had finished his meal he jumped up from the table and begged his mother to let him go to see a poor blind man who lived not far away and to let him carry with him those cakes which had not been eaten His mother was pleased with Peter's thoughtfulness and at once brought a basket filled with cakes for him to carry to the invalid while Peter's father was making him promise not to stay out too late soon the boy was on his way to his friends happy in the thought of the pleasure his present would give the blind man The old man was delighted with the cakes and at once broke and ate one. He began to tell Peter one of the stories for which he was famous and which he knew Peter loved to hear. But Peter suddenly remembered his promise not to stay out late and finally became so uneasy that he told the old man he must not wait to hear the end of the story. Hastily bidding him farewell started towards home his path lay beside the dike and along its grassy banks grew beautiful wild flowers of many varieties the flowers were so beautiful that peter decided to pick a bunch of them to carry home to his mother who was so much of an invalid that she rarely left the house so He picked a few here and a few there, blue and yellow and pink, until he had a handful of those varieties of which he knew his mother was most fond of and walked on. To keep himself from feeling lonely, he hummed a gay song. Suddenly, he stopped and neither sang nor smiled as he looked at a slender thread of water trickling through the grass. Where did it come from? Surely not from the canal, and there was nowhere else for it to come from, unless it came from the dike itself. The thought was enough to make even a child turn pale and tremble. Only the dikes stood between the boundless sea and the safety of little Holland. He looked again, and to his imagination, the stream seemed greater already. What could he do? night was coming in the road was solitary one there was only the barest chance of anyone passing that way whom he might hail or of whom he could ask advice then came a quick recollection of his promise to his father and he started homeward again but a force as mighty as giant's grasp made him turn back 
again to watch that trickling stream of water. He was near one of the great oaken sluices, and bounding up beside it, he carefully exclaimed the dike. There, as small as his fingers, was a hole, and through that little hole was flowing the stream of water at his feet. Like lightning, the flash of intuition came to Peter. If that hole were not plugged instantly, the force of the flow through it would rapidly increase from the pounding of that mighty sea behind it. In a night, the flood would break through the dike and perhaps destroy all the homes in Holland. What could he do? No stone would fit the hole. No amount of earth packed into the crevice could resist the pressure of the water. Peter was desperate. Forgotten now where his bunch of flowers which fell unnoticed from his hand, he strained his eyes in a vain search for travellers on that lonely road. Vainly, he shouted out for help until his throat was hoarse. What could he do? An idea struck him. Climbing again up the steep bank from stone to stone, he thrust his finger in the hole, and it fitted. It stopped the trickling water for the moment. But oh, what would happen when he took it out? Ah, uh, it was as clear as daylight. What to do? He would not take it out until someone should come to relieve him. Forgetful of what this idea might bring to him, if carried out, he chuckled with boyish delight in this real adventure. Ha ha, he said to himself, the water can't come down now. Harlem shall not be droned while I am here to keep the flood back. For a while, excitement kept him warm and fearless. When the chill darkness of the night surrounded him, all sorts of strange noises fell upon his unaccustomed ears. He seemed to see giants and demons lurking near, ready to pounce upon him and kill him. Although he was a sturdy lad, tears came at last. He could no longer keep back thoughts of his comfortable bed at home, of the parents who might be even then worrying about his safety. However, as he had stayed a night with the old man once before, his parents had probably gone to sleep without worrying too much, and Peter was out in the dark night alone. In such misery and pain, the pain grew greater, the misery harder to bear every moment now, but still Peter kept his finger in that dangerous hole. He tried to whistle hoping to attract the attention of a passing traveller, but his teeth chattered so much that he gave it up. Suddenly, he remembered what he had been taught at his mother's knee and prayed to the great God who could control the surging sea and protect a boy who was doing his best. If he ever prayed with his whole heart, he prayed so that night in the darkness, when his prayers were said, he somehow felt braver, stronger and older than before. And in his heart he said, I will not take it out till someone comes. I will stay till morning. Longer and longer grew the hours, the minutes, the seconds, and yet he never moved. There were strange noises in his head. His thoughts were confused. Pictures of his playmates, of events long ago forgotten, danced before his eyes. He was not sure he could draw his finger out of the hole even if he wished to do so. It felt so strangely numb. Why did it feel like knives were cutting and pins pricking him from head to foot? What would happen if no one ever found him, no one ever came to help? At last, the rose and silver of the dawn flushed the sky. Day had come and along that lonesome road came the first traveller in all the hours of Peter's vigil. A priest 
whose night had been spent by the bedside of a sick person was hurrying homeward on the path beside the dyke he heard a groan a feeble sound of someone in a lot of pain turning he glanced first here and there and looked up at last he saw the child writhing in agony in a single bound the priest was beside him exclaiming in the name wonder boy what are you doing here i am keeping the water from running out said peter oh can't you ask them to come quick and they did the town of harlem even holland itself had been saved through the courage of a little boy who did his duty from that day to this there has not been a single child in holland who has not heard the stirring story of chapter 10 palanquin bearers lyric poem kickstart have you ever seen a palanquin this poem describes an ancient indian tradition in which a young bride would be carried to her new home in a palanquin written as a folk song the poem describes how the palanquin bearers feel privileged to carry the beautiful bride lightly o oh lightly we bear her along she sways like a flower in the wind of her song she skims like a bird on the foam of a stream she flows like a laugh from the lips of a dream gaily o oh gaily we glide and we sing we bear her along like a pearl on a string softly o oh softly we bear her along she hangs like a star in the dew of a song She springs like a beam on the brow of the tide. She falls like a tear from the eyes of a bride. Lightly, oh lightly, we glide and we sing. We bear her along like a pearl on a string. Sarojini Naidu. About the poet Sarojini Naidu, eighteen seventy-nine to nineteen forty-nine, was a poet. a politician and a freedom fighter and an administrator her poetry earned her the title of the nightingale of india or bulbule hind the golden threshold is a collection of some of her best known poems chapter 11 the artists of mithila madhubani paintings theme art and culture india has a rich tradition of folk art folk art paintings include the worldly art of gujarat patachitra paintings from odisha the nirmal paintings of andhra pradesh and other such folk art forms madhubani painting also referred to as mithila art as it flourishes in the mithila region of bihar is characterized by line drawings filled in by bright colors and contrasts or patterns find out more about the art form from this interview with a folk artist you must have drawn and scribbled on walls with pencils or crayons especially when no one was looking well humans in very ancient times began painting the same way using colors from plants and flowers to paint on cave walls and floors and they painted so beautifully that the tradition of painting was kept alive sometimes by kings and rich nobles more often by the common people themselves in their own communities these styles of painting have come down the generations and have become a part of the folk art of our country india is like a 32 lakhs 80483 square kilometer large museum with many art galleries some natural some man made some ancient some modern 
Every region has its own school of art, its traditions of painting. Each has precious secrets handed down from master to pupil, mother to daughter, one generation to the next. One such school is the Mithila School of Art, also known as Madhubani paintings. Down the lanes of modern Mithila, artists painstakingly create one masterpiece after another, drawing, tinting, colouring on walls and flowers in today, more often than not, on handmade paper. Almost everyone in Mithila knows this traditional art, but some have given special gift for it. A gifted artist in the Mithila tradition, Shashikala Devi shares the colourful secrets of Mithila with the students from many schools and colleges. The interviewer Swapna Datta joined one such group of enthusiastic learners. Swapna, did you learn your art anywhere in particular? Shashikala Devi, no, there was no question of that. It's the traditional art of the Kayasthas of Mithila. I watched my mother, grandmother and aunt doing it. That's how I learned it. Swapna, did they know it then, all the Kayasthas of Mithila? Shashikala Devi Shashikala Devi, yes, after a fashion. Some have a special gift for it though. A gifted hand is what gives Mithila art that special touch. The paintings are drawn with very fine lines and they are designs within designs. Attention to the smallest detail is the speciality of this art. Mithila artists use various themes, symbols and subjects from myths and folk tales or from daily life. Lotus leaves, fish, bumblebees, peacocks, trees, elephants, women, men, children, gods and goddesses are all included to fill up these paintings. There is hardly any shading in the Mithila paintings. The artists use soft flat tones to show roundness, proportion and distance and sharp bold lines and curves to show force and feelings Kohabar, a special complicated design that is a must at all wedding ceremonies. Swapna, where is it painted? On the floor, like Rangoli. Shashikala Devi, no, on the walls. In fact, a separate room is made for the bride and the bridegroom, which is called the Kohabar Kaghar, and this special design is painted on its walls. Swapna, in colour? Shashikala Devi, oh yes, but mainly in red, and no black is used anywhere. Black is inauspicious, you see. Swapna, where do you get your clothes from? Shashikala Devi, well, we make up our own. For red, we use plain sindoor mixed with milk. For yellow, we use haldi. If we want green, we grind fresh bean leaves and extract the juice. Swapna, why only bean leaves? All leaves are green, aren't they? Can't one use just any kind of green leaves? Shashikala Devi, other leaves would not be of any use. I know because I have tried several without the least success. Swapna, do you mean to say that you don't use black at all in Mithila paintings? Shashikala Devi No, in Kohabar or for other auspicious occasions. But when we want black for ordinary use, we make it from Sooth. One makes Kajal. We light up an earthen lamp and hold a utensil over it and then mix the Sooth with kerosene when we paint. Swapna 
वॉट इज स्पेशल अबाउट द का कोहा बार शशिकला देवी यू नो इट्स ऑलवेज पेंटेड इन द सेम वे यूजिंग द सेम सिम्बल इन अ गिवन ऑर्डर ईच सिम्बल हैज इट स्पेशल मीनिंग फॉर इंस्टेंस लोटस लीव्स इन कोहा बार से दैट जस्ट एज द लोटस लीव्स फ्लरिश इन द वॉटर सो मे द ब्राइट्स हैपीनेस फ्लरिश स्वप्ना वॉट टू द अदर सिम्बल्स मीन शशिकला देवी द कोहा बार इज फिल्ड विथ फिगर्स ऑफ शिवाय एंड पार्वती लोटस सीड्स फिश बर्ड्स पी कॉक्स एंड बम्बल बीज देर आर इवन द सन एंड द मून द नाइन प्लैनेट्स एंड ऑल्सो द सी दीज आर ऑल सपोज टू बी विटनेसेस टू दी मैरिज स्वप्ना इज कोहा बार द ओनली पॉपुलर फॉर्म ऑफ मिथिला आर्ट शशिकला देवी No that's not all another popular form of mithila art is the kamalbha it looks like a garland of lotus flowers the center of which the bridegroom fills up with sindoor and sends to the bride swapna are all mithila paintings related to the marriage ritual shashikala devi to marriage or to other religious festivities Each puja calls for a special kind of alpana. Alpana is drawn using ground rice mixed with water. The one drawn in winter for Kartik ki ekadashi is drawn on the floor of the courtyard and continues right up to the puja room. Then there is the khadbar, a rectangular pattern drawn in the bridegroom's house when the bride steps in for the first time. Swapna are these traditional and ritualistic paintings still as much part of life as they used to be Shashikala Devi Yes of course Mithila art is still very much part of our lives Swapna One last question The women painters of Mithila lived in a closed society What led the women painters to share their work with the larger world Shashikala Devi There was a terrible earthquake in 1934 in the region William Archer the then local collector went to inspect the damage in Mithila's village and saw the wall and floor paintings for the first time Later he went back with his wife Mildred and photographed a number of them They recognized their great beauty and got them published in several magazines. This caught the attention of the artists and scholars. In the 1950s and early 1960s, several Indian scholars and artists visited the region and also became enamored by the paintings. In 1966, there was a drought in the same region. The All India Handicrafts Board sent Bhaskar Kulkarni an artist to Mithila to encourage the women to make paintings and paper that they could sell in order to generate money for their families this created a new source of non agricultural income the women artists were encouraged to produce paintings representing their tradition on handmade paper since then painting has become a primary source of income for scores of families target magazine chapter 12 around the world in 72 days theme travel kick start one sleepless night elizabeth cochrane who wrote under the name nelly b had an extraordinary idea She would break the fictional record of Phileas Fogg, who went around the world in 80 days in Jules Verne's popular novel. Read about her journey around the world in 72 days in 1889. In the late 1800s, it took many months to travel around the world. Boats were late, trains were slow, and connections were often missed. But Nelly checked the timetables and was convinced she could beat fogg's record her editor was doubtful a woman could not travel alone he argued 
and transferring her dozens of trunks would cause missed connections. But Nelly was determined. She didn't need a companion and could travel with only one piece of hand luggage. Besides, if the world wouldn't send her, she would simply find another newspaper that would. Finally, her editor relented. The question was, could she start her journey in two days? The short notice didn't faze Nelly a bit. She visited a dressmaker and ordered a dress that would stand constant wear for three months. Then she bought a long loose coat and one handbag, 16 into 7, into which she would squeeze all her essentials. For Nellie Blee, the clock began ticking at 9.40 a.m. November 14, 1889, when her ship, the Augusta Victoria, steamed away from its pier in Hoboken, New Jersey. She had been warned of intense heat, bitter cold, terrible storms, shipwrecks and fevers, but her greatest fear was failure. She said she would rather return dead than alive and behind time. Along the route, she would cable stories back to the world, sharing with her readers rare glimpses into life on the other side of the globe. No sooner had the Augusta Victoria left harbour than Blee was confronted with her first challenge, overcoming seasickness. And she is going around the world, one man's need. But Nellie's motto was, energy rightly applied and directed will accomplish anything. By the time she arrived in Southampton, England, she had conquered her seasickness and was in good spirits. From Southampton, Nellie made a quick side trip to Amiens, France, to meet Jules Verne. Together, they charted her journey on the map Verne had used to outline Phileas Fogg's route. Then, worried about missing her train to Brincy, Italy, Nellie departed. The trip through France and Italy was dark, cold and foggy. When the train arrived at Brincy, two hours late, Nellie feared her ship, the Victoria, had sailed without her. Luckily, it was still in port, so on she travelled without delay. On through the Suez Canal to Aden, Yemen, a shipboard friend told Nellie it was rumoured she was an eccentric American heiress travelling about with a hairbrush and a bank book. Nellie reached Colombo, now Sri Lanka, two days ahead of schedule. Then her luck ran out. Her next ship, the Oriental, was delayed five days. Any more delays between Colombo and Hong Kong would mean losing her race. Nellie lost patience when an elderly gentleman suggested that Colombo was a pleasant place to stay. It may be, she exclaimed, if staying there does not mean more than life to one. Nellie was infuriated by another day-long delay in Singapore, which she feared would seal her doom. That night, she endured agonies of suspense and impatience. The next day, she towed the city, though, and bought a monkey, who she named McGinty. When her ship finally sailed, it was wrecked by raking monsoons, which, at one point, filled Nellie's cabin with water. Against all odds, they arrived two days early in Hong Kong. Nellie was thrilled. It was the 39th day of her journey and she had travelled halfway around the world. Then, at the steamship company, a man informed Nellie that she had a competitor. Reporter Elizabeth Bislan had been sent by a magazine to beat Nellie's time and it looked like she would succeed. Nellie was further disheartened to learn that her own ship, the Oceanic, would be delayed five days before sailing to Japan. On January 7, the Oceanic began the Pacific crossing from Yokohama, Japan to San Francisco. Nellie had an ocean and a continent to cross 8,000 miles and only 25 days in which to do it. Everyone on board knew Nellie's story and everyone was rooting for her. The ship's 
chief engineer had embezzled across the engines for Nelly Blee will win or die. 13 days later San Francisco was in sight but there was more troubling news the worst snowstorm in 10 days had hit the northwest the planned train route was impassable the world decided to hire a special train to take a southerly route cross country all along the way nelly was greeted by crowds of well wishers bands and fireworks telegrams flowers fruit and candy poured in on january 25 1890 72 days 6 hours and 11 minutes after the start of her journey Nelly Blee set foot in the Jersey City train station a huge cheering throng greeted her cannons roared the american girl will no longer be misunderstood declared the mayor she will be recognized as pushing and determined independent able to take care of herself wherever she may go Nelly Blee had won much more than her race against the clock nelly's exploit increased the world's circulation by 24000 the newspaper described her as the best known and most widely talked of young women on the earth today it wasn't an exaggeration her picture appeared on games toys soaps and medicines a race horse hotel and trained one name after her The name Nelly Blee was heard and recognized everywhere. Born Christensen. Chapter 13 Trapped by a Tiger. Theme Animals. Kickstart Ruskin Bond, an Indian author of British descent, is considered an icon among authors of children's books. Read about the protagonist's gripping account of an encounter with the king of the jungle in a seemingly safe rest house. At the outset, let me make it clear to the reader that I am no hero, either in fiction or in reality. I have never used a gun in my life, except on the shooting range at school, where I usually miss the target by several feet. Although I grew up in an age when hunting wild animals was a pastime that was supposed to prove one's manhood, I developed an early aversion to the so-called sport of kings. If my cousins and their friends called me a coward, I wasn't really bothered. The extent of their bravery seemed to depend largely on the size of guns they held. All the same at age of 12 I was persuaded by one of my uncles to accompany him and his friends in a weekend's shikar in the forests near Dehra a small north indian town where my grandparents had settled These forests were then fairly well populated by tigers other big cats wild elephants and various species of deer They set up their headquarters at a small forest rest house in the heart of the jungle and from here the hunters set out early every morning often on elephants returning late in the afternoon well in time for the evening's whiskey soda to avoid boredom i had brought a couple of books along the hunters did not press me to join them on their forays into the jungle and i was grateful to them for that i was left with sandwiches in a thermos of tea and told not to stray from the rest house the caretaker a retired forest guard lived in a hut at the other end of the clearing and i was to call out to him if i needed anything it's perfectly safe here said uncle jim just don't venture into the forest on your own i was quite happy to see the hunting party march off into the jungle they would be met by the elephants at another halt I settled into an armchair on the veranda, read a little, ate a sandwich, kept one for later, and then, feeling drowsy in the hot April sunshine, dozed off. I must have slept for ten or fifteen minutes when I woke up. There was a strong smell of animal in the air. I did not have to look far to see where it came from. standing in the middle of the clearing some 30 to 40 meters away and looking directly at me was a massive tiger 
a monstrous tiger i should say because that was how it appeared to a 12 year old i know i wasn't dreaming because i could hear my heart thumping very loudly the tiger was silent it was watching me speculatively perhaps certainly with interest but not out of any feelings of friendliness it had just been driven out of the forest by a bunch of noisy shikars and it and it did not like the look of me or perhaps it did like the look of me brunch if not lunch hadn't there been rumors of a man eater terrorizing the villagers in the next district i got out of my chair very quietly dashed into the living room shut the front door and bolted it i then went to the nearest window and peered out the tiger had advanced a few paces raising its head it sniffed at the air it was obviously in charge of the situation where was that forest guard where were uncle jim and his great hunters never before had i felt so alone and so abandoned when i realized that i was staring out of an open window i shut it quickly it wasn't a very large window not big enough for a tiger to get through but i remembered that there were other larger windows in the building and the tiger had turned away from the veranda and was beginning to circle the house although confused and panic stricken i remembered that the back door of the bathroom had been left open i left the living room and dashed into one of the bedrooms there were two tumbled into the bathroom and shut the door with a bang the noise must have startled the tiger because he let out an angry ah oo na you know the kind of sound a hungry tiger makes you hear it often enough when you visit the zoo was the other bathroom door shut i raced across to the second bedroom there was a communicating door and into the bathroom the back door was shut bolted i was trembling almost crying with relief but how many doors and windows did that crazy bungalow have back in the bedroom i sat down on a bed and tried to pull myself together when i looked around i noticed that the bedroom window was half open and it was fairly large window without bars i crept up to it and peeped over the sill the tiger was in the backyard much closer to the house i could smell it its odor came to me on the breeze and horrid foul gusts a sickening odor and one that i shall never forget softly i closed the window and it bolted in softly i closed the window and bolted it this window had four panes of glass supported by wooden frames i was sure the tiger could smash through it but when i looked out i couldn't see the beast perhaps it had moved on seen something else returned to the forest i think i'm safe now i remember saying this to myself as i returned to the living room just then there was a heavy thump on the front door followed by an angry snarl i could hear the beast's claws rasping against the wooden door i leapt to the barred window and put my face to the glass and was just able to see a portion of the terrible creature as it examined and tested the door of the bungalow i was at my wits end shaking all over but i had to do something high up on the living room wall was a small skylight opening on the roof if i get get to it i could climb onto the roof i would be safe up there i pulled the dining table across the room then i placed a smaller table on top of it i he- i heaved a cane chair up on the edifice and climbed up on the wobbling chair meanwhile the tiger was making an awful din thrusting against the door with all its weight and tearing at the wood with its powerful claws i got the skylight open and climbed through i was out on the flat roof of the bungalow a good 30 feet above down level 
at the same time there was a tremendous crash as the door gave way the tiger was in the living room i looked down through the open skylight as it circled the small room lashing its tail and knocking over tables and chairs it stood up with its paws against the wall and stared up at the skylight its upper lip was raised exposing enormous fangs its eyes appeared to be glaring into mine but in that confined space it did not could not maneuver itself into a position to make a big enough leap for the skylight in its rage and frustration it turned its attention to my thermos flask and bit right through it and then in disgust it charged out of the living room and emerged once more into the clearing i watched it from the roof as it let out a roar such a roar of rage that all the birds flew off the trees crying out in alarm at the same time there was the sound of a gun being fired and the forest guard emerged from behind his huntsman reloading as he advanced the tiger who knew all about guns turned away from the bungalow and went bounding away towards the shelter of the jungle the guard fired again but the tiger was well out of range by then are you all right baba asked the guard as he held me down from the roof i think so i said but the tiger was really after me it's new to our range he said it could be the man eater we have heard about i will sit here on the veranda until the others are back an hour or two later the hunters returned a weary bunch they hadn't shot anything except for a few pheasants they looked rather foolish when they heard about the tiger's visit and saw the damage it had done i didn't say much because i was still in shock uncle jim was glad to find me alive but worried at what my grandparents would when they heard about the incident you won't tell them will you he begged your granny will never forgive me if she learns that i left you here on your own next time you should keep a gun with you advised one of his companions but i have managed quite well without a gun all these years it was some time before i could mention this incident to anyone partly because of my promise to uncle jim and partly because it took me some time to get over it ruskin bond chapter 14 the invisible man theme science fiction kick start if you were given the power to become invisible how would you use it the invisible man is about a scientist who discovers a way to become invisible initially excited about a life free of rules he quickly realizes the difficulties of being invisible This passage describes his first experience of venturing into the crowded streets of London as an invisible man in Oxford Street. In going downstairs the first time, I found an unexpected difficulty because I could not see my feet. I stumbled twice and there was an unaccustomed clumsiness in gripping the bolt. By not looking down, however, I managed to walk on the level passably well my mood i say was one of exaltation i felt as a seeing man might do with padded feet and noiseless clothes in a city of the blind i experienced a wild impulse to jest to startle people to clap men on the back fling people's hats astray and generally revel in my extraordinary advantage but hardly had i emerged upon great portland street when i heard a clashing noise and was hit violently behind and turning saw a man carrying a basket of soda water siphons and looking in amazement at his burden 
although the blow had really hurt me i found something so irresistible in his astonishment that i laughed aloud the devil is in the basket i said and twisted it out of his hand he let go of it and swung the whole weight into the air but a fool of a cabman standing outside a public house made a sudden rush for it and his extended hand hit me under the ear painfully i let the basket down with a smash on the cabman then with shouts and the clatter of feet about me people coming out of shops vehicles pulling me i realized what i had done cursing my folly i backed against a shop window and prepared to escape the confusion i pushed the butcher boy who luckily did not turn to see the nothingness that shoved him aside and dodged behind the cabman's four wheeler i hurried straight across the road and hardly seeing which way i went plunged into the afternoon throng of Ox- of oxford street suddenly a bright idea came into my head i ran around and got into the cab and so shivering scared sniffing with the first intimations of a cold and with the bruises in the small of my back growing i rode slowly along oxford street and pa- that possessed me was how was i to get out of the scrap i was in we crawled past muddies and they a tall woman hailed my cab and i sprang out just in time to escape her i headed to bloomsbury square intending to strike north past the museum and get into the quiet district At the northward corner of the square a little white dog ran out of the pharmaceutical society's office and made for me nose down I had never realized it before but the nose is to the mind of a dog what the eye is to the mind of a seeing man the brute began barking and leaping showing clearly that he was aware of me I crossed Great Russell Street glancing over my shoulder and went some way ahead before I realized what I was running towards I heard a blare of music and looking along the street saw a number of people coming out of Russell Square and the banner of the Salvation Army in front such a crowd I could not hope to go through deciding on the spur of the moment i ran up the white steps of a house facing the museum railings and stood there until the crowd passed happily the dog stopped at the noise of the band too hesitated and turned tail on came the band thud 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 came the drum with a vibrating resonance and for the moment i did not notice two urchins stopping at the railings by me see them said one see what said the other why their footmarks bare like what you make in mud i looked down and saw the youngsters had stopped and were gaping at the muddy footmarks i had left behind on the newly widened steps there's a barefoot man gone up the steps said one and he ain't never come down again and his foot was bleeding the thick of the crowd had already passed look there ted said the younger of the detectives with the sharpness of surprise in his voice and pointed straight to my feet i looked down and saw at once the hint of their outline sketched in splashes of mud for a moment I was paralyzed. Why, it's just like the ghost of a foot, ain't it? exclaimed the elder. He hesitated and advanced with outstretched hand. In another moment, he would have touched me. I took a step. The boy started back with an exclamation and with a rapid movement, I swung myself over into the porch of the next house. But the smaller boy was sharp-eyed enough to follow the movement. He was shouting out that the feet had gone over the wall. They rushed and saw my new footmarks flash into being on the lower step and upon the pavement. "What's up?" 
asked someone. Feet! Look! Feet running! There was an eddy of surprise and interrogation. The moment I was rushing, headlong round the circuit of Russell Square, with six or seven astonished people following my foot marks. My back had now become very stiff and sour. My tonsils were painful from the cabman's finger and the skin of my neck had been scratched by his nails and I was lame from a little cut on one foot. I saw in time a blind man approaching me and fled limping for I feared his subtle intuitions. Once or twice accidental collisions occurred and I left people amazed with unaccountable curses ringing in their ears. Across the square, a thin wheel of slowly falling flakes of snow was coming down. I had caught a cold and I could not avoid an occasional sneeze. And every dog that came in sight, with its pointing nose and curious sniffing, was a terror to me. Then came men and boys running, shouting as they ran. It was fire. They ran in the direction of my lodging, and looking back down a street, I saw a mass of black smoke streaming up above the roofs and telephone wires. It was my lodging burning, my clothes, my apparatus, all my resources indeed. I had burnt my boats, if ever a man did. The place was blazing. The invisible man paused and thought. Kemp glanced nervously out of the window. Yes, he said. Go on. Chapter 15. The Trojan War Theme Heroes, Kings and Queens Kickstart The two great Homeric epics, namely the Iliad and the Odyssey, were inspired by a number of events that took place during and after the Trojan War. A ten-year-long, gory, mythological war between the Greeks and the Trojans. Read this story and find out why the war was fought and what came of it. The king of Sparta, Tyndareus, had a daughter named Helen, who grew up to be the most beautiful woman in the world. Many Greek princesses came with rich gifts in the hope of marrying her. However, Helen showed her preference by crowning Prince Menelaus with a wreath and accepting him as her husband. After Tyndareus' death, Menelaus became the king of Sparta. Paris was the son of Priam, the king of Troy. He was known to be an excellent judge of beauty. Once, it so happened that the goddess of discord, Eris, threw a golden apple marked for the fairest among the goddesses. Each of the three goddesses, Hera, Athena and Aphrodite, wished to to be chosen as the fairest goddess. The king of gods, Zeus, refused to choose the winner among them and advised them to ask Paris. Paris decided to give the golden apple to Aphrodite because she promised to help him win the love of the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen, wife of Menelaus. This judgment of Paris angered Hera and Athena. The hens set off to plan the destruction of Troy. In the meanwhile, Paris travelled to Sparta and King Menelaus entertained him in his palace. As promised by Aphrodite, the beautiful Helen fell in love with the handsome Paris and she eloped with him to Troy. This outrageous deed enraged King Menelaus and the Greeks. Menelaus begged his brother, Agamemnon, King of Mycenae, to lead an army against Troy. Agamemnon sent messengers to Troy and demanded the return of Helen. When the Trojans refused, the Greeks sailed to Troy and declared war on the Trojans. The Trojans flocked down to the sea to defend their city. Many great heroes fought and fell on both sides in the gory war that followed. Great heroes like Odysseus and Achilles fought against the Trojans. Achilles helped the Greek army significantly by killing Hector, the bravest of the Trojans, and thus returned the tide of the war in favor of the Greeks. The Trojan War lasted for ten long years. At last, 
the Greeks prepared for the final attack by planning to trick the Trojans. They built a huge hollow wooden horse fitted with a trap door. Odysseus and Menelaus persuaded the bravest of the Greek soldiers to climb into the belly of the wooden horse. As night fell, the remaining soldiers abandoned their camp and pretended to sail back to Greece. In the morning, the Trojans found the enemy camp in ashes and a huge wooden horse on the shore. They thought it to be a peace offering made by the war-weary Greeks. They dragged the horse through the city and started celebrating the end of the long war. After much feasting and celebration, the exhausted Trojans fell into the deep sleep that night. A Greek soldier who was hiding on the beach sent signals to Agamemnon and the whole fleet drove shoreward. At the same time, the Greek soldiers inside the wooden horse opened the trap door and came out. They opened the city gates wide and the Greek army entered Troy. In the final battle that followed, the Trojans were defeated and the city was looted and burned to ashes. Chapter 16 The Road Not Taken Theme Life's Choice Kickstart The main theme of the poem, The Road Not Taken, is that human beings are confronted with and defined by the choices they make. The main idea of the poem is that the speaker is confronted with this fork in the road and must make a choice as to which road to take. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could. To where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just a sphere, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted view, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged the wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. About the poet, Robert Frost, one of the most celebrated poets in America, Robert Frost was an author of searching and often dark meditations on universal themes and a quintessentially modern poet in his adherence to language as it is actually spoken. In the psychological complexity of his portraits and in the degree to which his works is infused with layers of ambiguity and irony.